I'm Beth. And I'm Beth. Welcome, welcome to, to Physics, Physics with Beth and Beth. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to Physics with Beth and Beth. I'm Beth and today we are diving into our discussion of AP Physics 1 Unit 8, which is on fluids. And so specifically today, what we're going to be talking about is fluid statics. But first, let's talk for a little bit and really discuss what those two words actually mean. So normally, when normal, sane people use the word fluid in a sentence, they're talking about liquids. If I'm talking about fluids, I mean water, usually, or if I describe something as fluid, like if I say a dancer's movements were fluid, I'm comparing the dancer's movements to like a river or the flowing of water, right? But in science, whenever we use the word fluid, we're not using it like normal, sane people, and instead we are talking about both liquids and gases. So, that means that today is a very momentous one in our study of physics, because throughout this whole semester, as we've been doing all kinds of hard, confusing math, we've talked about projectile motion in the absence of air resistance, we've talked about free fall in the absence of air resistance, we've talked about forces and energy and momentum and rotational motion, and all kinds of things in the absence of air resistance. But today, we finally acknowledge that air does in fact exist. So now we're doing physics in a world that we can breathe in. Congratulations, guys. Um, so that's what fluids means. It means both gases and liquids. So as we go throughout this unit, we're going to be talking about the behavior of those substances and how they differ from solids. Now, whenever we talk about fluid statics, we're talking about fluids at rest. Statics isn't like as in static electricity. Static is instead as the static of something not moving. So we're talking about fluids that aren't moving, fluids that are at rest. And the main property we're going to be dealing with as we discuss fluid statics is a property known as density. So whenever we talk about density, because physicists are lazy and we like to abbreviate things, we often denote density with this little symbol here that looks kind of like a squiggly lowercase p. But it's not a P, it is instead a Greek letter. It is a lowercase Greek letter rho, because once again in physics we have run out of letters in the English language and have to go borrowing them from other alphabets. So this is just a lowercase Greek letter rho, and it represents density, and it has units of kilograms per meters cubed. And the reason for that is because density measures how much mass you have in a given unit of volume. How much, how tightly is stuff packed together? How much stuff have you fit in a given unit of space? And in physics, the units that we like to use for that are kilogram per meters cubed, because we're often talking about very big or very heavy things. If any of y'all have taken chemistry before, you've probably dealt with density, um, but you probably use something like units of grams per milliliter, because in chemistry, you're often dealing with very, very small things, or beakers and test tubes and things like that. Um, this is still a completely accurate and correct unit. We're talking about the same quantity, but most of the time, in the context of this physics class, we'll be talking about things that are big and heavy. So we'll be using kilograms per meter cube most of the time. But just know the units of density are units of mass divided by units of volume. One other quick note on our units here, grams per milliliter, whenever you hear milliliters, just know that's another unit of volume, and one milliliter is entirely equivalent to a cubic centimeter. We often like to use milliliters to talk about liquid volumes and cubic centimeters to talk about solid volumes because it's how we measure them, but they are entirely equivalent units of stuff. They're the same unit of space, so these two things are the same. Um, now, the way that we calculate density, it's actually kind of heartbreaking. We say that density is equal to mass divided by volume, or a little heart cut in half is always how I remember it. So it's m divided by v, and you can always remember that because it looks like a little heart that you cut into. Um, but we hope, we're going to try not to break your heart with physics today, um, but I'll, I'll stop with the puns, I promise, maybe. Um, <laughs> but it's mass divided by volume. How much stuff we have get divided by how much space it's spread out in. So that's what density is. But now that we've spent a little bit of time talking about what it is, we can now fill in this handy little chart I have up here. Whenever we talk about the states of matter, those are probably familiar to you guys. We're talking about solids and liquids and gases in the context of AP Physics 1. So whenever we talk about solids, 
and we talk about their mass, well, the mass of a solid is always going to be constant. Solids don't spontaneously change their volume. They take up the same amount of space. And because density is mass divided by volume, if mass is constant and volume is constant, then density is also constant. And uh, solids also don't change their shape, right? They don't melt or swoosh around or flow or do anything like that. Liquids are very similar. They don't change their masses and they also don't change their volume. So I'm doing a little C for constant in all of these blocks. Because their mass is constant and their volume is constant, the density of liquids are also going to usually be constant. However, liquids do change their shape. That's a property of liquids that you guys have probably heard before. If not, then you're at least familiar with it from uh, your day-to-day -day experience. Liquids take the shape of their container, right? If I pour water in a cup, it takes the shape of the cup. So the shape of liquids is variable. It does not stay constant. Now, gases are going to have a constant mass. A gas isn't going to spontaneously get more or fewer gas atoms. The amount of stuff you have stays the same. However, a certain quantity of gas could change how much space it takes up. Its volume does vary. And because density is mass divided by volume, if our volume can change, then the density of gas can also change. And as gas and liquids are both fluids, their uh, gases' shapes are also um, unconstant as well. So the main reason I went through this chart is to point out the density of solids and liquids is constant, but for gases, it is very much subject to change. All right, so let me erase all this so I have a little bit of room. And let's talk for a moment about what happens whenever we graph density. So if you were to graph on a little graph, let's say I put on my x-axis here, I put my volume of a substance, like in cubic meters, for example, and on my y-axis here, I put my mass with units like kilograms. And I plotted the mass versus volume of a substance. So say I had one cubic centimeter of gold and it weighed this much. And then I had two cubic centimeters of gold that would weigh more and so on and so forth. And then I drew a line through those points. We would find that the slope of that line, which was rise over run, what's going on on our y axis divided by how much change we have on our x axis. So we have our slope, oh, let me just write this. Our rise over our run. So in this case, that would be our mass divided by our volume, which is our little broken heart right here. So this is just density. So density is the slope of our line here. So whenever you graph mass changing over time compared to volume, or not changing over time, how your mass varies with volume. If you have mass on your y-axis and volume on your x-axis, then the slope of that line, your rise over your run, your mass divided by your volume is going to be your density. So this is often how you're going to be asked to find density from a graph on something like the AP physics exam. They'll give you a graph like this and ask you to find the density of an object. And now you know how. So, um, let's do a quick little bit of application here and run through this practice problem. So let's say we have one troy ounce of gold or 31.103 grams of gold and we're asked to find the volume of that. Well, we're given the density of gold. It's 19.32 grams per milliliter. And we know that so we have 31.03103 grams, and we also know that our density is equal to 19.32 grams per milliliter. Now, we've been doing a lot of unit conversions and we've paid a lot of attention to units as we've gone throughout this semester together, but you're going to find that paying attention to units is especially important whenever we talk about density. We like to measure density in all kinds of different units in all kinds of different fields because what units are useful changes a lot based on whether you're talking about something really big or really small. 
So we might measure it in bars or atmospheres or pascals or kilopascals or grams per milliliter or kilograms per meter cubed or kilograms per liter or, you know, all kinds of different things. But the good news is you guys know how to convert between units, but just make sure to pay attention to that, okay? Thankfully today we're given grams per milliliter and we're given grams for our mass, so that makes our life a lot easier today. We know that density is equal to mass over volume. If we know our mass and we know our density, then we just need to solve for our volume, right? Well, I'm just going to rearrange this little equation here by multiplying both sides by my denominator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by this V. Oh, that doesn't cancel. And then I'm trying to solve for my volume. So now I have volume times my density is equal to my mass. So I'm going to divide both sides by my density to get my volume alone. And now we end up with our volume is equal to our mass divided by our density. So now we know our density and we know our mass, so we can just plug those numbers in and we'll be almost in the clear. We are looking for our volume. We have 31.103 grams divided by 19.32 grams per milliliter. Let me erase this so I have a little bit of room. So if I have grams divided by grams per milliliter, this ends up giving me an answer with units of milliliters. Um, here, maybe I should write this like this, 31.103 grams over one times one milliliter per 19.32 grams. So if I have 19.32 grams per one milliliter, I can rewrite it like this. If I have grams divided by grams, those units cancel and leave me with units of milliliters. So I plug this into my calculator and I end up finding that I have 1.61 milliliters of gold. But because it's a little weird to talk about milliliters of gold, I'm going to convert this into cubic centimeters. So 1.61 milliliters of gold is the same as 1.61 cubic centimeters of gold. And so that is the volume of gold that we have. All right, that wasn't so bad. It was just a one quick little bit of division, plugging things into an equation that only has three variables. So it wasn't too bad. Let's go through one more quick little practice problem. And let's now talk about a swimming pool. I like swimming. I don't know how that's really relevant here, um, but let's talk about a swimming pool and try and calculate the mass of water inside a very large kind of Olympic sized swimming pool. So if we have a rectangular pool of length 50 meters with a width of 25 meters and a depth of two meters, perspective right there we go and a width of 50 meters there we go and um, we are trying to find the mass of the water that would it, that it would take to completely fill this pool so first we need to know the density of water to be able to do that and thankfully this is a number that's pretty easy to remember the density of water is equal to 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Now, when I first heard this number earlier, when we, I was prepping for this lesson with my fellow Beth, I was like, wait, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed? That sounds super heavy. And it does, because it is. A, water is very dense. It weighs a lot. So the civil engineering that has to go into building water towers and aquariums and pools is actually really impressive. Um, so. The density of water is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, and so if we want to find our mass, all we have to do is remember that density is equal to mass over volume. So if we solve for our volume and we know our density, then we can find our, ma our, our mass. So first let's solve for our volume of water here. We know that volume of a rectangular prism, which we're going to assume this pool is, is length times width times height. So that would just be 50 meters 
times 2 meters times 25 meters, which would be 50 times 50, which is 2,500, yep, 2,500 cubic meters is the volume of our pool. So then, if I'm going to take my little density equation and solve it for mass by multiplying both sides by my volume here, so mass is equal to my volume times my density, like so. I know my volume, I know my density, all I have to do is multiply those two values together and then we're home free. So the volume of a swimming pool here is 2,500 meters cubed times my density, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Cubic meter divided by cubic meter leaves us with mass with units of kilograms, which we want for our mass, so that's good. And if we calculate that, we end up getting 2,500,000 kilograms, which is very, very heavy. So swimming pools, actually very impressive engineering behind those because that is a lot of water. All right, everybody, that's all I have for you today. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments and we will get back to you as soon as, you can, as, soon as we can. Thank you so much for sticking with me through all of this. Um, we really appreciate all of you and happy physicsing.